This unit will focus on energy and enzymes, and in particular will focus on ATP, that's adenosine triphosphate, and how it can be used as a source of energy to drive lots of reactions within our cells. And we'll also discuss enzymes, these biological catalysts that are able to facilitate or catalyze very specific reactions within our cells. Before we talk about any details, let's first introduce some basic concepts, namely the idea of exergonic and endergonic reactions. Exergonic reactions are energy releasing. Think about burning a gallon of gasoline. That's an exergonic reaction. So exergonic reactions, uh, it turns out that the, the products of that reaction have lower energy levels than the reactants that you start with. In contrast, endergonic reactions, these are energy requiring reactions. So reactions that have to have an input of energy in order to take place. So whereas if you burn a gallon of gasoline, that releases energy, so that's exergonic. Think about plants. Plants can take CO2, they can take water, they can rearrange those atoms to produce sugars through photosynthesis. So that requires energy, typically energy in the form of sunlight. So that would be an example of an endergonic or an energy requiring reaction. If you're thinking about endergonic reactions, it turns out that the energy levels of the products are actually higher than the energy levels in the reactants that you start with. So again, that's, that's an example of endergonic reactions. Let's now talk about ATP. We always hear about how ATP can be used as a source of energy to drive lots of reactions within living cells. How does it accomplish that? Well, what we're looking at here is the structure of ATP. So adenosine triphosphate. Notice it has three phosphate groups shown here in yellow, one, two, three. Notice also that those phosphates have a negative charge. So what happens when you have entities with the same charge next to each other? Well, they tend to repel each other, right? But what we have here is a situation, it's, it, this is a stable molecule, these are covalent bonds here, but there's lots of potential energy stored within these bonds between these phosphate groups. So think of it like much like much like a, a coiled spring, right? So lots of energy just waiting to be released. So how does ATP provide energy to drive other reactions within our cells? Take a look at the reaction toward the lower part of the screen. What we see here is, is a molecule of ATP, and when it is used during a reaction, essentially what happens, it releases a phosphate, typically one of these, the, the end phosphate uh, uh, down here. So it releases a phosphate producing ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus our extra phosphate here. So when that takes place, that releases energy, right? About 7.3 kilocals per mole of ATP. So that's an exergonic reaction. Right, that releases energy. And it turns out that the energy that's released is coupled with other endergonic reactions within our cells. So for example, anytime you, you flex a muscle or you have active transport proteins moving ions across the membrane, right, that requires energy, energy that comes from the release of one of these phosphates from ATP. Now later on, we'll, we'll spend a whole entire chapter talking about getting this reaction to go in reverse. So essentially, how can we link this phosphate back to the ADP in order to make ATP? Right? As you might guess, that is an endergonic reaction. That requires energy. And that'll be the whole discussion uh, of cellular respiration and fermentation, which again, we'll, we'll talk about a bit later. So whereas ATP uh, can, can provide energy to drive lots of reactions within living organisms, there are other molecules, namely enzymes, that can facilitate or catalyze very specific reactions. So enzymes, most enzymes are proteins. And as such, they have to have a very specific three-dimensional conformation in order to function properly. So enzymes, uh, these are they're biological catalysts. They themselves catalyze reactions, but are not altered or not used up during the reaction itself. So an enzymatic reaction is illustrated toward the bottom here. The enzyme itself is shown in green. If you look, you'll notice these, these little indentation sites. That's just meant to represent the active site. So the active site of an enzyme, that's simply that part of the enzyme where substrates whatever it is that the enzyme is reacting with, where substrates bind and where chemical reactions actually take place. So in essence, what happens, an enzyme typically binds with very specific substrates. 
some reactions occur in the enzyme substrate complex, and then some type of product is released. For example, your saliva contains an enzyme amylase. Amylase is able to break down starch into its individual glucose molecules. So what happens, amylase, the enzyme, reacts with starch, the substrate, releasing glucose as the products of the reaction. But the amylase itself, again, remains unaltered, so it's therefore able to be reused in another reaction. So how then do enzymes facilitate or catalyze reactions within living cells? Well, enzymes essentially speed up specific reactions simply by lowering the activation energy. What that means is, is that it, it reduces the amount of energy that's required in order for specific, rea specific reactions to occur. So that is illustrated in this figure here. We're simply looking at a graph of energy levels on the y-axis versus time on the x-axis. First of all, we're looking at converting some reactants, could for example be starch, into some products. Again, it could for example be glucose molecules. Notice if we first of all focus on this upper curve in sort of a, a yellow color here, notice what has to happen is a certain amount of energy has to be added to the system, right? This would be essentially the activation energy before the reaction will occur. So before the reactants are converted to products. This upper curve here, that represents the activation energy or E sub A, energy subactivation, that's required without an enzyme. Notice, however, when we add an enzyme to the system, there's still some energy that has to be added to the system, but that amount of energy is reduced. So enzymes lower the activation energy. They, lower, they, they reduce the amount of energy that's needed in order for this particular reaction to take place. I should also point out that although enzymes lower the activation energy, notice that there's no change in the the, the amount of energy as we go from reactants to products, right? Whether or not you use an enzyme, that delta G, that's just the change of energy, that remains the same, okay? But again, the point is enzymes lower the activation energy needed for the re specific reaction to take place. If you look at this graph, what kind of reaction are we looking at? Is this exergonic or endergonic? Notice the products have lower energy then the reactants, so energy's been released, therefore this would be an exergonic reaction. If this were an endergonic reaction, the products would actually have a higher energy than the reactants that we start with. And again, that would require an input of energy in order to take place. So as we said, most enzymes are proteins. There are a few exceptions, certainly. But as such, they are subject to uh, a variety of, of factors that sort of control or have an impact on their, their rates of reactivity. So first of all, just a few reminders, enzymes do tend to catalyze very specific reactions. In other words, only certain substrates tend to bind with specific enzymes. And again, enzymes, since they're proteins, are affected by pH, temperatures, um, various chemicals that might be present as well, lots of things that can impact the structure of enzymes and, and therefore their, their activity. They often are under the control of competitive inhibition and allosteric regulation. So what is this referring to? Well, take a look at this figure here. Toward the middle, we're looking at competitive inhibition. Recall we said that enzymes typically only react with specific substrates. But what happens if there's a molecule present that can mimic the substrate and has the ability to bind to the active site of an enzyme. Essentially what, what will happen here is that that molecule, it could be a poison, uh, various medications work this way as well, but that molecule essentially competes with the active site and thereby inhibits the normal reaction that occurs as a result of this enzyme. So that's an example of competitive inhibition. In addition, other molecules can bind to enzymes in regions other than the active site. So again, lots of poisons function this way. Essentially what they can do is bind to an enzyme, not to the active site, but to some other part of the enzyme. When it does so, that can change the shape of the enzyme, and it can either help activate the enzyme and, make, and essentially increase its activity, as we see here, 
or that shape change can decrease the activity of the enzyme. Right? Again, enzymes are three-dimensional. have to have a specific shape in order to function properly. Anytime you change that shape, that can have a big impact on the ability of the enzyme to do its job. So the final concept I want to leave you with is this is a, is a broad question that asks uh, how, in, in general, uh, how are the rates the rates of enzymatic reactions regulated? And a common theme that we see in many enzymatic pathways is uh, this idea of feedback inhibition, also referred to as negative feedback. To illustrate this, let's think about uh, the, the basic notion of producing ATP within your cells. As you might guess, your cells can produce ATP, um, and uh, the ATP is also used up. But as you might guess, ATP would tend to be produced when ATP levels are low. If ATP levels are high within your cells, then there's no sense wasting time producing a lot more ATP. So how is this, how is this balance or this homeostasis accomplished? Well, this idea of, of feedback inhibition is illustrated in this figure. So let's say, for example, uh, product levels are low. So let's say we have low ATP levels in our cells. So our product is down here. Let's say this represents, again, just as an example, ATP. If product levels are low, enzymes you would expect to be active. So these various enzymes involved in the production of ATP, they're going to be active, ultimately producing more and more ATP. Well, that's fine, but it turns out that the ATP itself also has the ability to negatively impact some of the enzymes earlier in the pathway. So ATP might bind with perhaps this first enzyme or perhaps the second one, some, some enzyme in the pathway. When it does so, it essentially shuts down the activity of the enzyme, thereby reducing the amount of ATP produced. Right, so this, this feedback inhibition, again, this is just, just one example, this feedback inhibition or negative feedback tends to help maintain homeostatic levels for, for not just for ATP levels, but for lots of processes within your body. So that concludes our brief discussion of 